Good morning. I've got a a little longer to preach now. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to keep you too long. There's a uh, a difference between preaching and kidnapping, and it's a it's a fine line. No, I'm just kidding with you. This morning, uh, I want to talk to you today about two of the most glorious subjects that we can talk about as Christians. And Miss Ruth, I want to thank you for nothing but the blood this morning because that uh, that fits right in with what we're going to talk about today. I've got two subjects on my heart today, but we never word them this way anymore or we simply don't talk about them at all. Now the first one, is actually the Great Commission brought to life, but that seemingly has taken a back seat in modern churches today for a fun atmosphere and a good time. We want to please the crowd and send them home happy, and we have forgotten a lot of times today what the goal really is when we step into the house of the Lord. Now, the second one involves a word that's considered ancient by churches today. It's antiquated. We don't talk about it. It's not relevant. And so it's rarely ever preached on. But I want to talk to you today about justification. And then I want to talk to you about sanctification. Because they are both at the very heart of our faith. So I want to bring that up. What do the two mean, first of all? Justification means that we are declared righteous. And sanctification means that we are growing in righteousness. Now to start off with justification, I want you to picture this in your mind. Uh, I'm not going to... I'm not picking on single moms, but I want to imagine for a moment you're a single mother, you've got two children, and a man breaks into your house in the middle of the night. And you put the man down. You're arrested for it. You're brought to trial. There's a judge, a lawyer, a prosecutor, and 12 of your peers. Now here's the thing. You know you've committed the crime. You know you've done it. You've done wrong. You've asked for forgiveness for it. But you know you're going to be found guilty. And then that jury comes back and that verdict is not guilty. You were justified in your actions. You were justified in your actions. Isn't that great that when we go... In front of the Lord on that judgment day, that that's what He'll find us. If you've been saved, Jesus is your defense. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is that that we are declared righteous. We have been given righteousness by the Lord God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been given that. It's a free gift. Understand, though, that it is not our righteousness, but rather the righteousness that God imputes us or credits us with, with the righteousness of Jesus. Now, that is given to us by faith through mercy and grace, something that's renewed each and every day. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 64, 6, But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We're never to confuse the two, our righteousness with the righteousness that we've been credited with. It is not our own, but it is the blood of Jesus that has washed it all away. You are not guilty in the sight of God because there is nothing to be found. The blood has washed it away. Now we find first in Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 26, the Bible states this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God set forth as propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness. That He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Just and the justifier. It is Jesus alone that allows us to claim that righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That tells you right there, God gave us Jesus who knew no sin to take all of our sin on himself. So, for us, for us, that is us. That is is the one time it is okay to place yourself in the scriptures. That is the one time you can do that. Because it says right there, for us. It is given for us. Titus 3, 7 goes on to say that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Become heirs. We are His children. We are children of God. We have become heirs. We have gained so much the gift of eternal life, which is the greatest gift that could ever be credited to us, and yet we've done nothing to earn it on our own. And we forget that so much today. We want to give ourselves so much credit. We want to pat ourselves so much on the back for what we do. But it is not of our own doing. It is the fact that Jesus went to the cross at Calvary and gave us that righteousness. So now justification is easy for us to understand. It should be. We've, we've talked about it just now. We've, we've demonstrated how that works. Okay, <clears throat> It is the one-time gift of accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is that. It's just that. It is the act of being saved. It is salvation found right here at this altar, found anywhere that Jesus meets you. But I want to go back a minute to where it says in Isaiah that our righteousness is like filthy rags. You see, the the thing that we forget so often today is you do not have to have it together to come to Jesus. It's not necessary. Jesus will meet you no matter where you are, no matter what circumstance you're going through. Homeless under the bridge, living in a castle. Doesn't matter. He'll find you right where you are. And he'll accept you just as you are. Now that is justification. So I want to move on from that a little bit because the thing that we rarely hear, we hear about justification enough. We don't call it that today. We just call it salvation. We hear about that, but it is fading less and less. There are not enough offers to come to the altar. Uh, did a little poll last week, and it was amazing to me how many preachers do not give an invitation to come to the altar during the service. Why not? What are we there for? What are we here for? We are here first to take care of the flock that's here, That is to help grow in sanctification. But we also must know that there are those among us who are lost. We have to give the gospel message. That needs to be an everyday occurrence. Because everyone needs that shot at justification so that they can work towards sanctification. But rarely today do we hear preachers talk about sanctification and why again we've talked about it it's an antiquated word what does that mean what does that mean well let's talk about it because sanctification begins at the moment of justification at the moment 
And begins is the key word here. Because sanctification is a gradual and continual process. We have accepted Christ. Now what do we do? Well, the problem is is that rarely today are we told what to do after that first step. We're given the opportunity. We're given the offer. But it's a great reminder for all of us, too, who still are progressing in our walk with Christ. What comes next? What comes next? It is not enough for you to achieve salvation and keep it to yourself. It's not enough. And the problem that we have today is that evangelism has become so watered down that we throw John 3.16 at people. And we say, hey, he died for me, he died for you, can you accept that? If they say yes, we pray with them, high five them, you're saved now. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome this person into the family of God. On your way. All right. We've got more numbers to come. We've got more, more to come. We've got more to pray for. Is that it? Is that really it today? Is that really where it ends? No, not at all. It is a two-step process. First of all, we don't talk about repentance anymore. And repentance is a part of that justification. You have to admit and believe with your mouth and confess your sins to find that justification. You will not find that justification without humbling yourself before the Lord and admitting that. You will not do it. It is not enough to remember a Bible verse, claim your salvation, and go on your way. It is not. And that's the biggest heresy in the church today. Just come to the Lord. Just come to the Lord. But we don't tell anybody how to do it anymore. We don't give that information. We don't talk about repentance. Repentance is a dirty word because it goes along with conviction. Nobody wants to be convicted anymore. Because there is no right and there is no wrong. There's no moral high ground. There's nothing. There's not a moral compass anymore. As a matter of fact, this right here is our moral compass if we're living for the Lord. And the problem today is that this book, along with God himself, has been kept out of everywhere where he's most needed. It is the reason that we see the mass shootings that we see. It is the reason that politics has just fallen completely into disrepair in Washington. It is the reason for so many of our problems today is because God has become a dirty word today. We have made in God we trust a dirty saying in this country today. We shouldn't say that. Matter of fact, they have been working... You know, when the president gives his oath, when he takes his oath and he places his hand on the Bible, which, by the way, we'll be doing away with that before you know it. I promise you that. But at the end, he always says, so help me God. They've aimed to remove that as well. Why? I guess we don't need God's help anymore. We can do it on our own. (laughs) Where has that gotten us today? Where has that gotten us? Boy, that's gotten us in a real good place, hadn't it? So are we following through and helping make disciples of those who have been justified by grace? It's where sanctification becomes that topic. And it's where we don't find it hip enough to use anymore. We don't talk about it. But it is as important as justification As sanctification is simply this, it is the process of being made more holy. It is literally God conforming us into an image of Christ's likeness. That is what it is. It is God shaping you, not into what He wants you to be, but rather an image of His very own Son. An image of Christ likeness. I have to laugh because, again, we see it's not about who we want to be, but rather who God wants us to be. 
Now, I heard a preacher last week from the pulpit as he's preaching on self-help, which we should remove that word self to begin with because that's where the problem starts right there. And he gave, he gave a great, uh, <laughs> let's just say this was a very hip saying nowadays. He said, you do you, boo. First of all, I don't know who boo is. I don't have any clue. But I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, I'd rather not. I'd rather not. <laughs> I thought about my own justification, and I thought about all the problems that I had before my justification, and I thought, goodness gracious, me do me? That's what got me into the mess I was in to begin with. Why do I want to do me? <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's where the problem started. That's why I needed a Savior. That's why I needed Jesus. That's why I needed nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why I needed it. It's because me, myself, I had tore myself from one end to the other with no end in sight. And yet that's what they tell you today. You just do you. Hmm. Well, where does God fit into that? Where does God fit into that equation? We've heard many times that he's the potter and I'm the clay. We've heard that. Well, so that process is literally, again, him molding us into what he desires us to be. And that process is always ongoing. That never changes. The only thing that changes is that nothing stays the same as it pertains to you and I. We are to continually grow in that righteousness. We are not to stay the same. It's not enough. Like I said, that, that would be just, all right, I'm saved. I have achieved salvation. And then sit on your laurels for the rest of your life, just waiting to get to heaven. That is not what he desires either. He does not desire that. Now, a lot of churches today have adopted this, uh, this clever phrase. I've noticed more and more using it. No perfect people allowed. Now, that sounds cute, and that sounds cliche, but let's think about that. Because what that's doing today, that's correct. There are no perfect people. We know that. But is that giving our congregations today a license to sin just because we've been saved? I'm curious about that, because now the Bible states in 1 Thessalonians 5.23... Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6 goes on to show us what a very clear definition of sanctification is. As it says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, until un he has begun a good work in you. Listen to the words. The Bible comes to life if you read it and you listen to it. He has begun a good work in you, which means it is an ongoing process. It is continual. It is every day you should be getting up, denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following after the Lord Jesus. Amen. That is what we are called to do. That is living a sanctified life. I hear so many today say, well, live your best life now. I'm, I'm capable of living a better life now, here, if I'm doing it through sanctification, but I'm not going to achieve my best life here. My best life lies on that golden shore. When I walk the streets of gold, that is your best life. And don't buy into that myth. Don't buy into that lie that you can live your best life now. It's just not possible. But the worldly definition of sanctify is spot on in this case too, believe that or not. Sanctify is a verb... I'm not an English teacher. I'm not going to claim that. But 
sanctify is a verb, and a verb in a sentence is usually, that's an action that's being taken or being done. In other words, this is the action that we are to take. We can do that because justification, which we've talked about, is an outward acceptance of our Lord Jesus. But sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit that then resides in you. You have outwardly accepted Christ. Now the Holy Spirit comes within and that changes you. You are molded day after day as long as you are seeking His will. I'll tell you what the problem today is, is free will. Free will is the opponent of God's will. We were given free will, but free will against God's will will not prevail. It will not. And in saying that, I want to post this. I actually had a man that posed this question to me as he was being saved. He said, if I get saved and Jesus covers my sins, does that mean I can still go out and do what I want because I'm saved? Believe it or not, that's not a, an unusual question. That gets said a lot. People say that a lot. And it's not a crazy question because more than you know, even self-proclaimed Christians have taken to this attitude today. I'm going to pick on her a little bit because this was in the news recently and it, uh, we'll say it caught my ire. It, 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 it caught me and it hit me in a way that I just went, oh. You ever had that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach where you just feel kind of sick? Well, when I read this, maybe kind of sick. <laughs> uh, Hannah Brown, the woman who starred on The, the Bachelorette, this show that ABC has out. Now, she proclaimed her faith on the show. <clears throat> the show, mind you, where she was to decide between 20 men who would be her husband. And then she was asked in an interview how she felt about relations before marriage, in which she gave this answer. <laughs> Regardless of anything that I've done, well, people might think, Oh, that deserves a scarlet letter. That's not how it works. I can do whatever. I sin daily, and Jesus still loves me. It's all washed, and if the Lord doesn't judge me, and it's all forgiven, then no other man or woman can judge me. And that reminds me of one of my, my grandmother's favorite movies, Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou?, if you've ever seen that where the, they all go down to the river and there's a baptism taking place. And they ask one of them, he's kind of, he, he, he's maybe not all there in the head a little bit, you know. But he, they asked him, they said, uh, he says, come on in, boys, the water's fine. And he gets baptized and he says, what are you talking about? And he says, yeah, he says, the preacher says, all my sins have been washed away. He said, even that piggly wiggly I knocked over. And he said, I thought you was innocent of them charges. He said, I was lying. And the preacher says, that's been washed away too. So it was a pretty good joke, you know. But the problem here is the premeditation of sin. It's the premeditation of sin. Because she is okay going out and doing whatever because Jesus is love. We hear that. We hear that so much today. We forget about the wrath part of it. We forget about the just part of it. We said earlier he was just and the justifier. You cannot justify actions only in love. Sometimes it requires discipline. Just as your parents, I'm sure, if uh, you went out and had a little too much to drink and you stumbled in at 15 years old, I don't think dad just put you to bed and rubbed your feet and said, oh, don't worry about it. You'll feel better in the morning. I'll make you eggs and everything and bring them to bed for you. That didn't happen. No, you did something like that, you were sure to be disciplined for it. 
usually those were worse than the consequences from whatever you felt the next morning. So, but folks, he hardly died on a cross so someone could justify fornication. He hardly died on a cross so we could justify our own sins. It's not for us to justify. It's for him to justify. Not, a, not, a, not us on our own. So worse than that, one of the other men on the show told her that he wouldn't want to be with her if she'd been with others on the show as he wanted to keep himself pure for his bride. Now this is a man in his late 20s, and that's admirable in today's time of self-fulfillment and pleasure. That's very admirable. But guess what happened to him? <laughs> the network made him out to be the villain of the show. He was the villain. Hmm, wonder why that is. And everyone was so happy when she let him go. And she even did so with a rude hand gesture at the end of it. This is on national TV. But this is the self-proclaimed Christian that we talked about earlier. Who has the better witness in this case publicly? Is she living a sanctified life? Is she trying to grow in righteousness if she's out there doing that for the world to see? Now, I'm not just throwing stones here. I mean, like I said, any time I point a finger, I've got three pointed back at me. I'm preaching as much to myself as I do to a congregation. But this is what's been done with sanctification today. We don't strive for it. We have no goals when it comes to living a sanctified life. We set goals for everything else. But how we're to live as Christians today. We don't set goals for that. Why strive for something I'll never achieve is often the attitude. Or worse than that, well, I don't want to be one of those holier-than-now types. I've heard that a lot. Boy, I've heard that a lot. Well, you just turn your nose up, and I tell you what, if it come a good rain, you'd drown. No, it's not about that. It's not about that. It is about wanting to please God more than it is about wanting to please man. We are not here to please each other. We are here to please Him. And when we please Him first and foremost, we can please each other. That's how it works. It's supposed to go to Him first. God first in everything. But we don't do that anymore. We want to, we're, we're people pleasers. We're people pleasers. We're not God pleasers today. And that's the issue. So there's those today who go out and live like the devil six days a week and yet come to church on Sunday expecting the full blessings and holy manna of God. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If you're not doing something for him, why should he do something for you? I'm not saying he won't. You may catch a break here and there. But why? You've not earned it. You've not earned that. You didn't even earn your own justification. Now you want his blessings on top of that? You want all that he has to offer, but you don't want to live for him? Sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? Selfish. Self. There's that word again. Self is really the dirty word in church today. Because if we're not denying self, we can't do anything to please God. We can't do it. It's not in us. In the end, though, remember this when you think of your life for God. There are three stages of sanctification. I'll go through them pretty quick here. The first one is positional sanctification. This is the work that begins the moment we're saved. We talked about that. The Holy Spirit begins to shape you into a new creature. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new, which means you yourself, everything about you has become new. The old is passed away. 
So leave it there. Leave it in the past. It, it, it's not helping you and it's not going to help you move forward in a life for God. It's not going to do it. So drop it there and let progressive sanctification take hold of you. Now believe it or not, we're so self-indulged today. Guess what? This is where you come in. This is where you come in. This is where we can talk about self for just a minute. Because progressive sanctification is where you consecrate your life to God. Now consecrate, that sounds like a big word too, but that just means that you've been saved and you want to dedicate your life to a higher and holier purpose. You want to truly live for Jesus, now you're still going to sin. Let's not... Let's not say that we're not going to sin once we've been saved. I've actually heard people say that. Well, I didn't sin anymore once I was saved. <laughs> no, you still did, I promise. Some little way you did something, okay? You, you uh, took two lumps of sugar when Mama told you to just take one, okay? And you said you only took one, but you took two. That's that little white lie. You still sinned, okay? <laughs> so... No matter what it is, it can be something so small or it can be something so big, you're still going to sin. Why? Because we're human. It's in our nature. It doesn't give us a license to do it. You should still want to strive to do better. But just having the knowledge that you're still going to sin, because that allows you to feel convicted, and that allows you to repent of what you've done, which is what we have to continue to do. That should be a daily process. Repentance should be a daily process. When you pray at the end of the day, your prayer should be something like that. Lord, forgive me for anybody I've transgressed against today or anything that I might have done that wasn't pleasing in your sight. That's, that's asking forgiveness. That's humility. That's humbleness which is what we're called to be as Christians today. We are called to be that. Because it is God that we're striving to please. And let me tell you, you can't come to Him anything but humble. He is Almighty God. You are broken you. Come to Him with that humble nature. I promise you're going to get all the blessings that you need in your life. It may not be everything you want, but He will take care of your needs. Your needs will always be met. And then we have ultimate sanctification, or what we call glorification. Now we won't achieve that in this life on earth at all. But if we strive to live for Him, we will be called to heaven to receive that glorified body and be in His presence forever and ever. That is the ultimate sanctification. That is glorification. That is glorious in itself. I want you to think about that for just a minute. I want you to think about the moment that you see his face. The moment that you receive that glorified body. Think about that for just a minute. <clears throat> First John 3, 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. We shall see Him as He is. We don't yet know what we'll be like. But we know that He's striving to send us into that image. That's what we're aiming for. Now I have to ask you the question today. Don't you want that for your life? Don't you want that? Listen, it's not easy to be a Christian today, but there is still a right and a wrong way to live. Believe that or not. Don't listen to what you're told out in the world today. Because <laughs> the world's messed up. The world's messed up. You're not going to hear that out in the world. You're not going to hear, there's right and there's wrong. You're going to hear, everything is good. Everything is good. Don't worry about it. It's all covered. But the Bible tells us plainly how to do it the right way if we just open the Word and study it. 
The Bible tells us very plainly how to live a life sanctified. And if we work to read His Word and allow it to transform us. See, that's the problem today. We open this Word and we want to change what it says. We want to change the Bible into whatever we want it to say. When it's exactly the opposite. We should be allowing this Word that never changes, never changes... Listen, God doesn't change. He, he was the same yesterday. He's the same today. And praise God, He's going to be the same forever and ever. And so will this Word. This Word will not change for that world. But yet they want it to. And they want it to do that for us too. They want us to fight amongst ourselves and to, be, to transform this Word. Instead of allowing the Word to transform us. He will reveal Himself to us though. If we allow Him to work through us and transform us through His Word. And that's living a life saved and sanctified. I'm going to close with this and it says, Paul writes in Romans 6, 1 and 6, 2. Remember these verses when temptation arises. Or you question why it's necessary to live your life for Him. Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? He poses the question right there. Why should we want to continue to live a life in sin? We think that if we live a life in sin and then we just keep coming back to repentance and keep living that premeditated sin, that grace is still going to cover it. There's just more grace, more grace. The problem is, is that we're not thinking about less sin, less sin. There's got to be a balance. There should be less sin if there's going to be more grace. But I want to close with this, and this is how we will close it today. Uh, Miss Hope, if you'll come and play. I want to give the invitation this morning. And when I give the invitation, I want you to think about this. I'm going to give this, I'm going to direct this at teenagers specifically. I want you to think about maybe a friend that you knew or maybe you yourself. Did mom and dad go out and buy you a car? Did mom and dad go out and buy you a car that you didn't earn? You did nothing to earn that? You hadn't worked for it. You didn't earn it yet. Mom and dad just gave you a gift, and they gave it freely. Why? Because they wanted you to have it. <laughs> what are you doing with that gift? We certainly don't want to run the wheels off of it today. You want to cherish that gift. You want to take care of that gift. So why should your salvation be any different today? If He's given you the gift of salvation and the gift of eternal life, why are you not cherishing that the same way? You didn't earn that. You didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. But He gave it to me. He gave it to me because He loved me and loves me still. And He gives it to you because He loves you. And He loves you still. That's why. So if you've got a need this morning, if you've never given your life to God, or you need to rededicate your life, the altar is open this morning. The altar is open for any need that you may have. For anything that you need. Come and lay it down right here. There's never going to be a better time than right now. Right now is the time to do it. Salvation is today. Today is the day of salvation. How many times would Brother JT say that? Today is the day of salvation. He would say that again and again because he knew that in his heart to be right. And we know that in our hearts to be right. So if you do, if you've got a need, you want to cherish the gift that you've been given... Come right here and tell him how thankful you are. Tell him how thankful. If you've done him wrong, you can make it right. You still have time. You can do that today. 
I'll let Miss Hope play. <laughs> 